Dear Chairman, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for uh, this meeting, the Bamba Vacation Club uh, 2021, and the hope uh, to meet you uh, physically next year, inshallah, after the COVID-19. Um, each of us would like to simplify the procedure, but sometimes the winds come with expected scenarios, and this is what happened in this case. So what looks easy is not usually easy. My patient is 60 years old, female patient, uh, hypertensive, smoker, uh, complaining of typical exertional chest pain, the maximum medical treatment uh, with normal echocardiography and the normal uh, resting ECG uh, and the positive stress test. I decided to do cryoangiography for her and uh, I found med uh, LED calcified region with 80 to 90 percent stenosis. This is the coronary angiography of the patient here. Very tight stenosis at the level of the diagonal, size of the diagonal branch. This is the tight stenosis. I did, decided to prepare the lesion by using a balloon 2.5 by 15 balloon at 12 atmosphere, inflated the balloon at 12 atmosphere. And this is, was the surprise after inflation of the, of the dilatation, perforation at the crime with the, the diagonal branch. So, how do you stop bleeding from the coronary artery? I, sta I, I, I started by the regular method using ballooning for the perforation. For 10 minutes. After ballooning for perforation, still the perforation is, is present. Balloon inflation was continued for 10 minutes, T-segment elevation with BVCs, OCG. Patients suffer from chest pain. The blood pressure gradually decreased. This was a very uh, stressful condition. How do you stop bleeding from the cranial artery? So I, 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 I decided to, do, to go to the next step to, to, to search for the output uh, 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 graph sent. But this was the second surprise. I didn't found the size, the sizable graft stand at this moment. So, do you know over the wire balloon? I was lucky, and the patient was lucky. The over the wire balloon, as you, as we see here, has two lumens: human for the wiring and human for inflation. So, I pulled up, I pulled back the wire. I injected self block in, in this lumen and the other lumen, I inflated the balloon and to block the, the, the part of the perforation and maintaining the distal perfusion for the myocardium. I put a long wire, 300 centimeters, then I put over the wire the balloon and then I inflated and pull back the wire and I injected self blood into the wire lumen of the over the wire balloon by putting another sheath in the contralateral side of the femoral artery and taking self blood I, 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 and then re-inject this blood into the lumen of the wiring in uh, the over the wire balloon. This is the principle of this balloon, of this my technique. I pull back the wire, inflating the balloon, injection of self blood into this lumen. So uh, I'm maintaining, I'm maintaining the distal diffusion of the rest of the myocardium. After this method, injection of self blood, the ST segment elevation was decreased, and the chest pain in of the patient disappeared. I uh, I maintained the the inflation for. 20, 25 minutes continuously with continuous injection of self blood. Here, as we see here, over the wire balloon, the site of perforation and distal diffusion is maintained. Here, I blocked and I inflated the balloon at uh, 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 the nominal pressure. Uh, I think it was uh, eight or nine.
then I uh, I put the guide wires, deflate, deflating the balloon, and reevaluate. Uh, and this is the final angiography after the over the wire balloon. The perforation is sealed. Uh, good BTCA. This is another projection. Here also, good BTCA. I decided after this uh, good angiographic result by uh, to stop at this level uh, and uh, put the patient on dual interpreting and on the maximum medical treatment and stop at this level. My take home message is. PCI is not just passing wire and creating balloon or protein since it's a matter of how to deal with complications. Uh, over the wire balloon could be a simple method and uh, effective method to uh, seal perforation of type uh, two and three. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, effectively, the, the simplest technique is uh, to cover the the perforation with a covered stand, but uh, it didn't have. Uh, the oldest will remember, remember the old uh, perfusion balloon we had uh, in 25 or I don't know how many years ago. And uh, it does not exist, I think, anymore. Right? Yeah, they, uh, they are. They still in are. Japan? Right. None in Europe. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, Olivier, this is uh, Mathieu. Yeah, Mathieu, uh, hello. Hi, hello, hello. So I have one question and one comment. Uh, my, my question is, you throughout the procedure, you consequently did not uh, protect the branch, yeah, the huge, huge diagonal branch. Could you explain? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, you are right, but um, uh, I decided just to uh, to breathe a little first and see what 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 is the. Uh, what will happen? And um, uh, my pre my my, uh, my way uh, for the PCI is just to simplify. So I deci I decided at this case just to do provisional stenting, and um, I uh, I will not I, I, I at that at that moment I didn't uh, put in my mind to proceed to do uh, to uh, to go to uh, to stent techniques. That's it. So I yeah. didn't. Put, yeah. yeah, you're I, right. But, of course, uh, one stand is okay, but uh, with side branch protection, definitely. Uh, this. Okay, and my comment is that uh, this is uh, a, a great case and a lesson for us of the fractal anatomy of uh, bifurcations. Yeah, so yeah. vessel tapers with each branch that gives uh, that takes off uh, the vessel. Here, what you what what we have seen was a LAD distal to two large side branches especially the second one was was a huge side branch and the bigger the branch the uh, the higher the uh, the difference be, be the, between the proximal and distal part of the vessel so uh, i i suppose that 2.5 of course there was also a lesion per some perhaps some calci calcified nodules but you know the 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 the, uh, the real diameter of distal lad could could have been uh, smaller than 2.5 because of two large vessels uh, taking off before the before this uh, this lesion. Yeah? So so yes, I think uh, that's, I, that's the explanation. I, I agree with you. Uh, my estimation for the size is I um, I, uh, uh, I need to, uh, at that moment to use 2.0, uh, not 2.5. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, I have uh, a comment on this. Uh, I, I have the same idea as you. Uh, 20 years ago, there was the perfusion balloon. It was very easy to, to use. But uh, with this case, we can use, in the bifurcation especially, we can two over the wire balloon. Because this was uh, the Carina side. If you don't know where there is the, the perforation, is that you, uh, you, you go with two over the wire balloon, you do a kissing, and then you can perfuse the diagonal and the LED. Yeah. Is 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 an idea to have in the? There is an obvious flap uh, which uh, caused uh, obstruction after the balloon inflation. So the, my question is, uh, did he think about uh, stent implantation after all? Because that was an unstable situation. 
stenting uh, of the LED after uh, sealing the perforation. Yeah. Um, uh, after uh, after after what I what I saw in this case uh, and the good angiographic results, I decided uh, not to put stents uh, for fearing just to open the the perforation again. So. Uh, um, I decided just to to, uh, to be satisfied by this angiographic results and the end by this. And I followed the patient uh, after this for uh, uh, three and six months uh, with the stress test, uh, it's normal stress test after that. So I was satisfied by this result. Okay, okay Eric, okay, just a last question. Comment. Yeah, or comment. I think you, you were probably a little bit lucky because if you have a giant type 3 perforation, whatever balloon sealing you will do, it will always lead yeah, to tamponade. Okay. What, if you don't have a covered stand, what I've been seeing doing in some countries is to cut off the, the part of a balloon, mm -hmm. put it like a, a parachute. Uh, I, I would use a, 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 a gentle word, yeah, parachute is safer yeah. than other words, over the stand and then deploy it, uh, which is of course not optimal way because probably risky for thrombosis but that I've seen been doing that in some countries. I think you okay nice, nice comment. Yeah. Can I have just one more comment? Yeah. Also I think I must agree and this is something that they usually do if they don't have cover stand on the shelf yeah. and also some other places I think it is very lucky to escape not to have a propagation of the perforation even by just injecting with his, the, the patient's own blood because of the perforation, there's also some dissection for sure, and it can go down uh, the vessel. So I think uh, some other places, they usually do just at least do one stand, and then do one stand uh, to the same place. So that means that the ceiling and probably the two layers of stand uh, partially can can stop the, the, the potential perforation. Right. But after, after doing two stands, then you, even you can go out with a wire, maybe you can inject uh, some thrombin, uh, just in case uh, if you see some more of the perforation. Still, if it's a large perforation, you know, even covered stands, you still have bleeding. Mm -hmm. You need to post dilate. Uh, sometimes you miss the perforation, very big perforations. Without the cover stand, it's impossible. Yeah, absolutely, you need to have it. Thank you very much. We have to move uh, for the next presentation. With uh, so, uh, well, just one comment. Remember all the cases because uh, we are not so uh, we are not so many here. Uh, we have got a vote from uh, Twitter yet. I know the, which is uh, the winner uh, from Twitter, but uh, we have to select the, the award at the end of the um, of the session. So. Remember the cases, and uh, at the end we will uh, vote for the winner. Uh, next, uh, next is Dr. Fuladvan, with a very interesting case. Also, one moment percutaneous treatment of severe aortic and left main stenosis plus all three vessels coronary artery disease in patient with low ejection fraction by aortic balloon valvuloplasty impeller implantation of complete revascularization. Thank you. Thank you very much to the chairman of the bifurcational club and the bifurcational club for this invitation to present my case, which title is one moment percutaneous per treatment of severe aortic and left main severe stenosis plus uh, all three arteries in with stenosis in patient with very low ejection fraction, biotic balloon bubbleoplasty, impel implantation, and complete revascularization. By the way, this case was complicated with the femoral artery perforation due to the failure of Manta closing device, result with implantation of covered peripheral stent. Operators, Dr. Bernardo Cortez, Iardino, Dr. Gaetano Di Palma, and me, Dr. Fuladman. Department of Cardiology, San Carlo Clinic, Milano, Italy. We're talking about a patient of eight years of age without any previous disease that he came in our hospital with a, a dyspnea lasting uh, for several hours. And at arrival, her ACG demonstrated these signs of ischemia on the precordial leads and signs of the pulmonary congestions and her laboratory findings were high 
um, sensitive, uh, sensitive troponin that was more than 3,000 nanogram per milliliter. The patient was uh, prepared with depth um, uh, treatment and uh, for the treatment of the next day with angiography. And by the way, her um, echocardiography demonstrated severe calcific lesion with uh, stenosis of the aortic valve and ejection fraction something about 30%, so a really difficult patient. Next day, angiography demonstrates osteostenosis of the right coronary artery and stenosis of the mid uh, segment and severe stenosis of the left main and circumflex and uh, mid to proximal to mid LAD. Here we can see the situation with the left main, I think it's a really dramatic situation with the left main and also the mid LAD. So the patient came on February 2015, uh, 20, 2020. The plan was same name PTCA of the right coronary artery. And the next day after the evaluation, vascular evaluation, Doppler evaluation of the iliac arteries to, to, to make the aortic valvuloplasty for facilitation of the impella placement and left main treatment with two uh, stains, uh, double stain treatment of the left main, and possibly treatment of the circumflex and the LAD by the drachylutic balloons. And then obviously closing, uh, removing of the impellant, closing of the uh, access side. You see two stains in the right coronary artery with quite good result. Next day, placement of the uh, temporary pacemaker, um, valve. 20 millimeters balloon for the aortic valve valvuloplasty and the valvuloplasty while the pacemaker is working. Once did that, we placed uh, from the left femoral artery the impeller device and uh, turned, the impeller was turned of um, waiting to reach the safety of 2. Point, uh, steady of 2.5 liters per minute hemodynamic support. After that, from the radial artery, from the radial artery, we started the predilatation of the using the uh, seven French EBO catheter. We starting preparation of the left main with uh, with a, first of with normal balloons. After that, with uh, so I mean semi compliance balloons, after that, with the non compliance balloons uh, separately or uh, in kissing manner, and with the unsatisfactory result, then we pass to the scoring balloons again, the same thing. So we decided to treat the patient, the left main, with the shockwave balloon 3.0, 50 millimeters, four. Uh, sequentials for the left main LED and the same for the cycles for the left main circumflex artery with obtaining this result, which is acceptable for stent placement. So we decided to place uh, one dedicated stent, the only one remained in the market, a bio stent from left main to the circumflex artery. This is a drachylutic stent, and this is the immediate result after of the uh, this stent placement. Then we performed predilatations of the mid LED, proximal LED, and osteal LED, and then with a non-compliant balloon, and then we placed a, a drachylutic stent from left main to the LED, something like a, a short kill lot stenting, finishing the left main treatment according to the bifurcation, European Bifurcation Club uh, consensus document with the pods, and then with the kissing balloon, and then with the repot. And after that, for reducing the metal, uh, non-using stent, we use the drachylutic balloon for the left uh, uh, descending artery, proximal mid part, the same thing we performed for the circumflex artery. With the final result, this is a quite acceptable result. So finishing the procedure, remove the impeller device and close the access side with a Manta closer device. The patient then was transferred to the coronary care unit Exactly five to 10 minutes later, patient demonstrates a, a complaint, a intensive pain in the lumbar and iliac region with a severe hypotension and the immediate vascular ultrasound demonstrate uh, a, a, a rupture of the femoral artery. 
and the hemoglobin in urgent uh, evaluation from 13 grams per deciliter uh, went down to the 8 grams per deciliter. The patient immediately was retransferred to the our CAT lab while compressing the uh, femoral artery. And from the from the from the right uh, femoral artery by crossover, we then we saw the rupture of the femoral artery exactly of the, on the place of the manta uh, closer device. So we put a, a, a cover stent on this place here. You can see the cover stent, and the final result was quite good, quite good. The patient remains in the department in the cardiology for two weeks at least, and after that she was transferred to the rehabilitation unit. This uh, complex structural aortic valve treatment and coronary multi procedure involving the, all the arteries has those important implications in time of pandemic restriction. Decision of treatment must be done using the available in-hospital facilities. The presence of aortic valve stenosis and multivessel disease and low ejection fractions require contemporary preparations, aortic valve for hemodynamic support during coronary angioplasty. Structural complex coronary procedure requires meticulous procedure planning as in our case, and vessel preparation is very important. It's even must before stent placement using any kind of the balloons and and, uh, and the plaque modifications, rotablation, arterial catheter, shockwave, and whatever it else. Two stent strategy, uh, particularly when treating multivessel coronary disease, is important. But when it's possible, it's not bad. I am saying it's not bad to use dedicated stents, aiming to reduce excessive metals in such a complex patients with multivessel disease. Tracheolutic balloons are valid, really valid alternative to the tracheolutic stents. And unfortunately, when you have a vascular access site complications, particularly when they are dramatic, in the experienced hands, uh, those complications can be managed within the cat lab uh, percutaneously. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, operators Cortesi, Ardino, De Palma, and Full Advance from Italy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very challenging case, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, some comments? Yeah? yeah? I really want to congratulate you for managing such a really complex case. And I do have a question. Uh, could you help me understand why you started out uh, working on this right coronary artery, even though you had a flow-limiting problem on the left side, before you used that impeller? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, and the question is quite uh, interesting. Generally, my opinion is when you have to deal with the left main complex situation on the left side, prepare something simple, which is the right coronary artery, to have a better supply and to can count on the on the right coronary, which is treated. It was two, two stenosis, very simple. That was uh, the, the idea. Another question, uh, you start with the two stent stra strategy. Do you think about that the provisional stent will be better because uh, uh, there is an 85 years old man with a low uh, ejection fraction and also aortic stenosis, so uh, maybe there is also uh, atrial fibrillation there, so maybe he will need a long-term anticoagulation and anti-aggregation therapy, and also I don't think that his quality of life uh, will be ruined if uh, something happened with that uh, RCX, bec um, RCX because uh, RCX are very great and uh, you perform a great uh, job with it, that uh, right coronary artery. So the question is uh, why, why two stent strategy instead of the one stent strategy for left main? Well, I think that uh, your question is fantastic about the one stent strategy about the left main. But in this left main, I think it's absolutely yeah. impossible to do one stent strategy. This was a completely 99% subocluded uh, stent, so uh, left main. So uh, the, even after the predilatation, the result was suboptimal. So the, 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 with a need of a two stents. Um, about the lady, about the quality of life, she, was, she came in out of the hospital without any treatment. She was never ever 
entered in the hospital, so she had a very good quality of life, so she deserved a, a, a good coronary treatment. This is my opinion, obviously. Yeah, concerning the, the two-stand strategy, you, uh, you, have the, you, you usually use the, the bio stent for culotte or uh, for provisional? Because here you, you, you use a dedicated stent to the culotte. Uh, it's your uh, daily practice in, when you do culotte or? Uh? No, 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 it's not a daily practice. The general no, bios, you, bios. It's the usual practice. Yeah, yeah. Bios is a stent. Uh, it's a good stent, but generally I think it's yeah. a, for the provisional standing, not to touch so much the side branch. But it gives you the opportunity to access yeah, yeah. the side yeah. branch okay. if you need very easily. In this case, we use the bios just for the reason that with all this calcium and these difficulties to be something to uh, facilitate entering toward the left, uh, to the descending artery, and then with the second stent, left main, short kilot or kilot, you cover the carina perfectly, so it's yeah, okay. Yeah. That was the reason. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand. It's just to know if you, usually when you do a kilot, you do like this, or you do with a walk of stents? No, generally two of kilot stent. yeah. with two yeah. stents, yeah. Uh, normal stents. Yeah, Yanis, yeah. last question. You have to move. Last question with three components. So, um, number one, um, do we feel that imaging here would give us more confidence in terms of like uh, the final result? Number two, was it so necessary to uh, balloon this valve to advance the impeller? Was it so tight, the ostium of the valve? And, um, um, and third, single axis also sometimes, uh, single axis technique like the, the same arteriotomy for both the impella yeah. and the PCI saves one arteriotomy. That's a consideration. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, the first question was um, about the impella, whether uh, balloon valvuloplasty. Well, we decided to do that. I mean, it's a rare case. I know that uh, Imad, who is, uh, who is over there, Dr. Shaman, he said me about a case that he put a contemporary impella, and after that, while the impella is there, he performed the valvuloplasty. These are the rare, rare, very rare cases, and I think uh, every, everybody should manage them according to his experience and his understanding of the situation. Uh, Ah, imaging, yes, in this case we did imaging, I didn't put because in eight minutes, eight minutes it's not possible to put everything. It was a very complex case, everything in eight minutes is not possible. Thank you very much. Now we move to, uh, with the next case, the third one. Thank you. Uh, the third one is uh, from Dr. Gupta, it's uh, called uh, Calcified Left Main. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the chairpersons of the EBC for giving us this opportunity to be part of this wonderful meeting. So I'll be presenting a calcified left main case from India. So the patient was an 82-year-old male who presented to us last year with history of class 3 angina for a few months. He was a known case of CAD for last 20 years on medical follow-up. And he also had unstable angina for a week. He had negative biomarkers for myocardial infarction and had an ejection fraction of 40% with inferior echinacea and normal valves. On the diagnostic angiogram, we found a diffuse triple vessel disease with critical distal left main lesion. His coronary arteries were heavily calcified, and there was long segment disease in the LED and the circumflex. As we can appreciate in the cranial projection, the LED was diffusely diseased, heavily calcified, and was also giving some collaterals to the right coronary artery, which was diffusely diseased with an occluded PDA. In the spider projection, we appreciate eccentric lesion of the circumflex, which had a tight osteal lesion and diffuse disease about 70 to 80 percent extending beyond 20 millimeters into the circumflex body. So the patient was calcified left main triple vessel disease and was discussed in the heart team meeting for the best treatment strategy. Considering his age, he was refused for CABG and was planned for a PCI strategy. For PCI, first we needed to decide the best strategy for the distal left main. Here we thought it was a Medina 111 lesion with heavy calcification and long segment disease of the circumflex. So we decided to treat with an upfront two stent strategy for the left main. We decided to use a seven French guiding catheter and insert a prophylactic IEPP from the left groin as we did not have impella at our institution and to do the uh, procedure under imaging guidance with rotablator upfront considering long diffuse segment disease, uh, which was heavily calcified in the LAD. So we used a 1.5 millimeter burr for the distal left main, which crossed uh, successfully. And then we used the same 1.5 millimeter burr 
or the mid LED, which crossed after some time as there was some tortuosity in the mid LED. So after successful rotablation, we protected the diagonal and we did the first IVAS graph. On the IVAS, we had three points of interest, the distal, the proximal LED, and the distal left wing. So all around the LED, we saw circumferential calcium, as we can see in point one, with an MLD of two millimeter and some rota effects from six to nine o'clock. The calcium appeared thick. At point two again, we had thick calcium, which was circumferential, and thick calcium from 12 to six o'clock. And in the distal left wing, we had a calcified nodule from 11 to one o'clock with favorable wire bias. After the IVAS, we took a 2.5 millimeter NC balloon, which failed to dilate at 28 atmosphere. So we were left with a few options. One option was to use a two millimeter burr based on the IVAS findings and MLD of two millimeter. But we thought probably the risk of slow flow and no flow will be very high. And also the patient had an occluded right and a very advanced age. Second option could have been to use a cutting balloon at high pressure, which sometimes does not work as the uh, calcium appeared very thick on IVAS. I will be thought is probably the best option considering a 360 degree ring of calcium and knowing that IVL and rotablator can be very complementary. So we used a three millimeter IVL balloon for the mid to distal LED and gave 40 pulses each after which the balloon dilated successfully. Following which we used a 3.5 millimeter IVL balloon for the proximal LED which also dilated successfully after 40 pulses. After this, we stented the proximal to mid LED lesion with two overlapping drug eluting stents, which expanded well. And then we turned our attention to distal left wing. Distal left wing, first we treated with a 3.5 millimeter IVL balloon and we gave 30 pulses at this location. And then we used the 3 millimeter IVL balloon, which we had used for the distal LED to treat the ostium of the circumflex. During the second cycle of our IVL balloon at the ostium of the circumflex, the IVL balloon ruptured as we can see on the left panel. And this caused a large hematoma in the left main and the circumflex. The cause of the balloon rupture could have been nodular calcium at this site as we had not done rota in the ostium circumflex or balloon properties. We immediately stented the left main bifurcation with a mini cut strategy and stented the circumflex with a 3 into 26 and left main to LED with a 3.5 into 26 millimeter DEF. We did a pot in the left wing with a five millimeter balloon. And then we did a final kissing balloon with 3.5 and three millimeter NC balloons in the LED and circumflex respectively. We got a good angiographic result as we can see in this caudal projection. And we got a good angiographic result in the cranial projection with a no occlusion of the diagonal. After this, we did an IVAS, which showed well expanded stent in the distal LED here we can see pre and post of the distal LED where we got an area of nine millimeter scale. And this is the pre and post IVAS of the distal left main at the site of the calcified nodule where we got very good stent expansion, which is very circular and area of almost 16. We could not do IVAS unfortunately in the circumflex as the patient had a distal wire perforation which we had to balloon up to. So in the final IVAS all across the left main LED, we got areas in addition of almost nine millimeter scale and 16 millimeter scales in the left main. So these were the final pictures in the cranial and caudal projections. So in summary, uh, we think that diffuse calcified lesions are always a big challenge and it is our duty to do a safe procedure for our patient. Imaging is extremely beneficial in such cases to select the best device for plaque preparation and also to see the results of our plaque preparation. Imaging is also important to prevent complications. And we believe that rules of life are equal to rules of truth. So rules of life, like we all have our own weaknesses and we need to collaborate with other people to achieve more. Similarly, all the tools have their own weaknesses and strengths. So rotablator, IVL, cutting balloon, they all have their own strengths and weaknesses and they can be combined in a synergistic manner to achieve better outcomes and safe procedure for our patient. And upfront use of IVL should probably be avoided without prior imaging to prevent complications and to use it more effectively. So the harder it is, the softer we must go. And I hope we meet Dr. Goran and Dr. Eve and the EBC members again. So thank you so much for uh, allowing us to be part of this wonderful program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. Questions for uh, Dr. Gupta of the calcified lesion? Uh, 
I have Wait a comment. Uh, the, I appreciate the fact that this case demonstrates how uh, uh, you cannot rely only on IVL if you have in your cat lab. You should rely on the old rotoblator because uh, yeah. most of the times you have to prepare the lesion with rotoblator, the IVL will not cross. Imaging is, uh, is, is a good example of, of how you should treat a very classified lesion with an expert operator that should be able to use all the array. So use a cutting balloon, the limitation of the cutting balloon, the cutting balloon, it can bro break, you can trap the cutting balloon, I had a problem, I had to, to send the patient to the surgery because the, if you burst the cutting balloon, the cutting balloon is trapped by the calcium, then uh, it's difficult to. So you have, you have to manage the calcified lesion in a stepwise, like a provisional stepwise decision, and one device up after the other, you have to reach a good result. Yeah, yeah imaging also is very important in this case to check the, the before the procedure, of course, and uh, after the result with the, uh, after rotablating so much calcified lesion and something. And uh, what is uh, very interesting is, you, is your approach because uh, uh, with this kind of calcification, complex bifurcation lesion, calcified uh, circ, you, you, uh, you had an approach with uh, stenting the main vessel first and not uh, stenting the side branch first. So uh, I think it's uh, very interesting uh, uh, to see this, uh, this kind of approach. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, question? another question here. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just a short question regarding the exact cause of the rupture of the balloon of IVL. It could be interesting to discuss this kind of uh, complication that can occur during calcified lesion. Yeah, thank you so much for the nice comments and question. So actually the, the generation of IVL balloon that we have in India is, is the previous generation, the one which was used not in the DISRUP3 trial. So we have a single membrane IVL balloon, so which is more prone to the rupture. And uh, we think that the, the last pulses of the IVL balloon are always a problem that it can rupture in the last pulses. But in this case, the distal left vein had a very heavy calcified nodule which in the direction of the LED we had prepared with a rotablator because it had a favorable wire bias towards the LED, but we did not do rotablator into the circumflex. So I'm not sure whether the ideal balloon ruptured due to the thin uh, balloon structure or due to the calcified nodule at that location. And for precisely this reason, we believe that if there is no upfront imaging, we should probably avoid using IVL balloons in nodular calcium to prevent similar complications. Okay, any more? Thank you very much. Can I just make a comment about that as well? I think the, uh, I think the IVL, sorry, it's Peter O'Kane. Yeah. Hi, I think the IVL uh, balloon rupture, we saw that as well with the first generation. And I think particularly when you've uh, tried to, you've had it used and you're trying to uh, deploy it in a new vessel where there's calcium, you're very likely to kind of, uh, you know, damage it further. I think maybe a strategy in this case, it was a brilliant case, but maybe just using a bigger burr in the left main might have facilitated slightly better preparation. And maybe then we're going to treat the circumflex. I think rotation atherectomy into the circumflex with that one five burr may have also made life a bit easier, but you, you dealt with it very nicely. It's a really nice case. Thank you. We move uh, with the fourth case from uh, Dr. Grohn. Hi, Dr. Grohn. Uh, bifurcation with challenging weighing. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is a 55 years old male patient who complained of chest pain for five years, which has been controlled with medication. But uh, it was related uh, to a CISIS class 3 since 20, 20 days ago. He was hypertensive and a chronic smoker and had a hypercholesterolemia. And ill rejection fraction was normal and uh, there was no reasonable motion malady. But surprisingly, first angiography of left coronary artery showed the left main total occlusion. And the right coronary angiography showed the, the abundant uh, collateral circulation to LAD and also circumflex from RC. Uh, this is a bilateral injection. You can see that the total occlusion is very short and the circumflex comes just after the C2 segment. And uh, unfortunately, circumflex ostium looks like uh, disease. Uh, this is uh, the true bifurcation uh, left main CTO case. 
So uh, we uh, started with uh, uh, seven French XP 3.5 for left and six French JL4 guiding for right and the UV3 guide wire and in the Corsair micro -catacan. So we tried integrated approach first because it's very short and after uh, uh, 10 to 20 minutes uh, trial, we successfully uh, wired the, the Compass Pro to diagonal, uh, which was exchanged to uh, a soft wire run through. The, actually, we are uh, talk about the, the, the sub-intimal uh, location of the wire. This is possibility, we are not sure. And with the help of uh, Sasuke Katata, uh, which is a double lumen microcatheter, we uh, very easily uh, get that wire down to LED. This is IBUS. Uh, this is LED. So the wire uh, is uh, traveling uh, almost in the true vibration. This size is uh, more than four, almost five. And this is left main and true vibration. So we did a 3.0 balloon, 12 atmosphere. And we found that uh, the ugly uh, looking ostium of circumflex ostium, the angle is really unfavorable and very, uh, there was a bit of hypersynosis. There might be uh, some flex shift from uh, left main to circumflex. It is very difficult wiring, but the diagonal ostium, I didn't think that we need a wire protection. You can see a uh, ugly looking uh, circumflex ostium again. The plaque is uh, here to here. So actually, the first thing we did was uh, the IBIS marking because uh, we are really looking at the true uh, circumflex ostium, but actually it was not so helpful. Anyway, we started wiring uh, with the UV3 wire in Sasuke and XTR, the more softer wire, the probe in the circumflex. And actually we found that the wire is getting into the uh, circumflex ostium, the wire prolapses often because of this, uh, there is a no support. So we changed the strategy with the support of uh, uh, the 3.0 balloon. We tried the harder the using XTR and UV3. Uh, uh, in the Corsair micro -catheter. But during the procedure, actually, we found that the circumflex was totally occluded, and uh, we next thing we uh, considered were, was a retrograde approach for circumflex. But unfortunately, circumflex is uh, supplied by the, uh, the the very tortuous epicardial collateral. It's nearly impossible to, uh, to travel. So circumflex totally occluded and, and uh, very complex collateral circulation. So what to do next? Uh, we have, we can consider uh, four options. Comcast Pro, CETA procedure for circumflex and the uh, path for left main and uh, retried uh, wiring and retrograde approach for circumflex anyhow and left main to LED standing first. And we select the option, last one, left main, LED stamping, and wiring, trying wire the left circumflex afterwards. So we implanted the 3.5 by 23 millimeter Zeiss Sierra. Of course, the circumflex is completely gone. And epicranial, you have, you can see the complete uh, circumflex complete gone. But we know the, uh, the location of the uh, location of the circumflex ostium, so we can try wiring here. The first thing we should do for the wiring is uh, the proximal optimization technique. So to widen the cell struts and left main standing, uh, we have a better chance to wire the circumflex ostium because wider space between standard struts. And this is a collateral uh, uh, contralateral injection. It can estimate the location of a circumflex. Uh, after about five minutes, uh, try to pass the wire. It suddenly, uh, I felt the release of the wire. This is uh, UV3. And I was surprised. 
But in this view, actually, uh, fire doesn't look like in the right way. But with epicardial view, you can see the wire uh, maybe in the true lumen. Anyway, I felt released. And so I confidently, with confidence, I progressed wire to the circumflex and the 1.5 loom and the change to uh, soft wire. We could see the large optimism marginal, like here. We did the three point all balloon, the 10 atmosphere, and uh, uh, wire replaced uh, reposition to uh, optimism marginal. This is IBIS examination from here. Actually, this is ostium of circumflex. The wire travels the, the true lumen. So next step is very easy. So I try the tap technique with the science Sierra 3.5 by 23 millimeter in circumflex with the balloon and stand balloon in the LED. And the implanted low pressure, considering the small size of the marginal, pull back, higher pressure, and the finish with the moderate pressure kissing ballooning. This is uh, Ivers from LED. So I'd open and very short. This is Ivers from circumflex. Circumflex of uh, is wide open, and uh, you could see the very short uh, stent carina. This is the final end geography. The diagonal ostium is pinched, but uh, we have no problem with that, of course. Okay, uh, this is the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Ergun. Uh, wonderful case. Uh, question? I've, I've got a comment after, but uh, questions eventually? Yeah, Thierry. Yeah, I think uh, it emphasizes the role of pot when you are doing uh, this kind of bifurcation. But the pot can be done before stenting also. And uh, there was uh, recently a publication showing that uh, you may show the ostium of the occluded side branch just by doing a pot before stenting. So did you try that uh, in other cases, for example? Uh, what is your experience? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't uh, uh, have to see you, Dr. Lefebvre, but so that I could understand what, what type of top balloon for the circumflex or left main? No, for the, for the circumflex. So, so you, you decide to stand left main to LED and mm. then to, to use a pot to access to the cirque or to reveal what is the ostium of the cirque. But you can do also before stenting, so predilatation, doing pot uh, proximal mm. to the cirque, and then you may see yeah. uh, the ostium of the cirque okay. and it will, it will okay. facilitate the access. Yeah, then, then maybe, uh, then maybe uh, an option, but uh, I think that the uh, uh, Compromise or circumflex is caused by the uh, osteal disease itself, but uh, also by the uh, the plug shift from the left, left main. So in IBIS study, we uh, previously showed that the plug shift comes from the proximal part of the application. So I think a part uh, will uh, um, make us a further uh, plug shift. And actually, the after stenting, I think that there is more space to try and easier to, uh, to target the circumflex ostium. So, but uh, you'll try, I think uh, uh, maybe next time I'll try you, uh, your plan, <laughs> your strategy. Thank you. Uh, Eric? Yes, very short uh, comment. The super cross is sometimes yeah, yeah. sometime incredible, yeah. nice catheter yeah. with the yeah. pre-shaped uh, tip. Mm. Uh, it's really a great thing to have yeah. on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have the same. Uh, I have a, a similar case. Uh, I had the venture at the time. Yeah. It was occluded, uh, and uh, with the venture, because when you go in a in a very tight lesion to the stents, uh, the guide wire will prolapse in the LED or will bend. So if you have this, uh, you know, venture or yeah. super cross, then it's you can that you can direct. Yeah, the, there are uh, oh, oh, super cross or venture are very helpful in a big vessel, in proximal big vessel. When you it's reach not, uh, it's, it's not more distality, it's, um, it's, uh, you risk the section. But uh, well, actually, here it's really, yeah. Actually, yeah. I, I think the state here was, was changing the anatomy, making it more, yeah. uh, more easy to cross. Because mm -hmm. here, I mean, if, if you will pot left main without stand, then we might dissect. And trying to, with the wire, you can 
you can dissect more and more, and will, you'll have still having a difficult anatomical uh, mm. anatomical uh, um, challenge. So if you put the stent, you will straighten left main. It makes more easy to cross to to uh, circumflex, and I, I think he. He did it very well, and uh, you see that, yeah. Hmm. You see that the, the wire crossed easily after stenting. Yeah, by I was previous, the stent, we saw also the dissection. We had dissection in the proximal, which was occluded, of course, so it's, it's difficult to recross uh, uh, into the dissection. So maybe after the stenting, you are not uh, this kind of dissection, uh, and yeah. so Absolutely. it's easier, yeah. It's a challenge. It's a but it's it's very very good case, very beautiful case. Beautiful case. Uh, it was the same comment with the super course. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Guon, for this uh, beautiful case, and uh, see you at, at the end. Uh, next much. and last case. Uh, it's from uh, Dr. Santoso, uh, left main cradifurcation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for the invitation to present at the EBC meeting 2021. The title of my presentation is A Case of Lamb in Quadrifugation Stenosis with Very Long Term Follow Up. I have nothing to disclose. The patient was presented with non STEMI. He has a history of breast angina since one week. ECG showed negative T waves in P1 to P5. Laboratory investigation revealed elevated cardiac enzymes. He was treated with uh, standard medications, including dual antiplatelet uh, and also uh, enoxaparin. The coronary angiogram revealed uh, left main quadrification stenosis with critical stenosis in the distal left main and also critical stenosis in all side press OCA as shown here. And there is also uh, stenosis in the first the immediate brands and flow in the LED was sluggish and there was no collateral from the right corner arm to which was normal. You know that there is no technique described to treat modification stenosis in the current guidelines or in any consensus. So uh, we tried to apply the risk stratification models as syntax score, euro score, GRC and NERS scores. And we concluded that the patient was in a high PCI risk, high cabbage risk, and he also had a high risk for maize and sand thrombosis. However, the patient declines uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. So if we want to do quadruple sending, we have to be mindful that our guiding catheter cannot accommodate all stents. So initially, we uh, opened up the stenosis in the LED ostium because flow in the LED was sluggish and followed by opening the first intermediate branch ostium followed by stamping of that vessel and then uh, we have to use two guiding catheters. Uh, we have to avoid twisting of the guide wires and we should know the technique to deal with it should this happen. So then we dilated two other uh, side press OCA and this is just to show uh, the all, all OCA less stenosis after balloon validations. And following this, we did a sequential quadruple kissing stenting uh, in all the side branches as shown here. And this uh, was followed by final quadruple kissing balloon validation. And uh, we obtained a uh, very much acceptable result as shown here. So to perfectly fit all lesions, of course, uh, we don't want to induce left main dissection. So we used the area preservation uh, formula like this, and we came up with a left main diameter of 4.76 millimeter if you want to use a uh, four stance as we use in these uh, patients. So of course, uh, we need four pairs of hand to do the procedure, and this is uh, the situation the cat lab at that time. So we obtain excellent result shown here. At eight months angiographic follow-up, there is no resonosis, and uh, the distal I mean, uh, showed a very small aneurysm, which is uh, of no clinical significance at all. Lost to follow-up and came back seven and five years later because of exertional antenna for two months, and the angel showed uh, instant resonosis in the proximal LED 
a new uh, stenosis in the mid LED, a new stenosis in the uh, proximal and mid LCX. So we fixed this with uh, two overlapping stands in the LED, a good result, and also two overlapping DS in the LCX, and we obtained excellent result. This is uh, just to show uh, the result of the stenting. LED and LCX appear dominant as compared to both intermediate branches. Ten years later, the patient show up again because of recurrence of exertion of angina. At this time, the left man had very nasty looking lesion, diffuse and critical stenosis here, and there was a focal uh, instant stenosis in the osteum of the LED, LCX, and all the side branches. So again, we have to use double guiding catheter any. Shown here, uh, we did the sequential followed by quarter ball kissing balloon dilatation, and we use a DCB to treat L the LCX stenosis and DES to treat left main to LED and narrowings here, and then we finish the case with up in the left main. And we obtain excellent result like this. The narrowings in the intermediate the branches were left as they were. Eleven years later, patient show up without any complaint, just for follow-up. And there was a very focal instant stenosis question mark in the awesome of the LCX and both intermediate branches. All other stands were eaten. OCD showed well endothelialized stands in the lamin and the LED and uh, penetrated instant stenosis in the cerc osseum. We did also functional study. PFR from the left main to the LED was perfect, 0 0.98. And then uh, we put, uh, we did also IFR, and IFR in the uh, left main to the LCX was one, and QFR 0 0.98, so good result. And this is a view of the uh, LCX and the osseum looks perfect. And the patient was there for on optimal medical treatment. Summary, so this is a, a patient with non-STEMI caused by a left main quadrification stenosis modified Medina 11111. The patient was in a high risk for PCI and cabbage, successfully treated with a quadruple stenting of the left main in all side branches. And Eight months, all stands were beaten. At seven and five years, there was new stenosis in the LED and LCX and instant stenosis in the LED, treated with stenting. At 10 years, there was uh, left main stenosis and focal instant uh, stenosis of all side branches, treated with quadruple kissing balloon dilatation, DEB in the left main and LCX, and stand the left main to LED. And at 11 years, uh, stands in the left main LED were beaten. There was a minor penetrated incendiary stenosis in the LCX uh, osteum with good flow and incendiary stenosis of both intermediate branches treated with optimal medical treatment. And this is summary of the summary. Not fear of failure, but rather fear for not trying. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Santoso. Uh, ju just uh, a question uh, first. The, the first uh, procedure, which was, uh, because we have got Yves Louvari, so uh, with the four, four stent and the same procedure and, uh, and the same, it will be, uh, we need precision. The, fir the first technique uh, for the, the quadrifurcation stenting, it was SKS for each osteum or it was uh, something different? The technique for stenting. The technique is just simply a uh, quadruple stenting uh, to all. Uh, the first one, the first one, the, the, first, the first one. It, it's it's quadruple V stenting? Yeah, quadruple, quadruple, v, quadruple stenting to all the v, four yeah. branches. Without stenting the, the body of the left main. At the, at the osteum well, only. The stent protrude a little bit to the left main, and that's why we SKS, quadruple SKS. Yeah. The okay. Section <laughs> the left main body. Yeah. 
and we use the formula and uh, according to okay. the formula the lambent diameter is l even less than 5 4.70 something so uh, with this uh, uh, stand selection we can we can treat all the side brands but at the same time avoid inducing the section in the left main yeah, yeah. So, Santoso, this uh, Patrick here. So you must realize that uh, we were in the cat lab together between what, 76, 77 until I don't know. So I know Santoso quite well. I call him Santoso, by the way. <laughs> and uh, that technique of double catheter and uh, four balloons simultaneously, that's something we developed with Japan Burger, that probably you don't know anymore, and uh, George Cianos. I mean, that was the technique when we had these uh, cadre bifurcation. And I think that story is absolutely remarkable. I mean, uh, I, I've heard the case before, because if you go today to the Syntax Core 2020, that person will be excluded definitely from PCI, yeah. okay? And I think that what is remarkable in the Far East is that this still has to the patient, do you want to have a PCI or bypass surgery? And of course the answer is PCI because it is in the Asian culture. But what is extraordinary is that he, he applied what Andreas Grunzig called the dentist approach, you know? You go one time for this, you go one time for that, and then finally you get the, the final treatment. And he's a superb, superb operator. So don't try to do what is he doing with two guiding catheter. I'm a little bit uh, uh, ashamed that I have introduced that kind of technique with uh, George Cianos and Nia Van Berger, but you know, there was a time we thought we could do everything. Uh, it's a little bit different today but it's a superb job. The question I have for you, uh, Santoso, the real question, the serious one, is today, with all kind of prediction medicine, you know, we have some prediction medicine which is working better and better and better every day. If you say to the patient, your mortality will be, let's say, 35% with bypass surgery, and it depends very much on your surgeon, okay, because that's what we don't put in the equation. The quality of the surgeon, the quality of the PCI operator, that, that's something we cannot control. But if you say to your patient, it will be uh, mortality at 10 years with uh, PCI 35%, and with bypass surgery 12%, what would say the, the patient? Of course, uh, I have to be honest with the patients, and I, I, I completely uh, agree with you that uh, this is not a PCA case. Actually, this is uh, more a bypass case, but the patient declined surgery at that time. I, I can understand. I would also decline bypass surgery. The question is that if I'm informed about the numbers, you know, because that's what we do today. I mean, at the outpatient clinic, you make some, yeah, score is never perfect, but it's getting better and better and better, the machine learning and all these things. And if I say, yeah, bypass surgery will be 12% and PCI will be 35%, do we have to say that to the patient? At least in the Western country, we do more and more, yeah? Because we have nothing else. I mean, as a physician, you can do it, other people can do it, but it does, it's not because you can do it that it is the best therapy. So, I mean, I, it's really my question, how much the patient has to be informed with numbers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when he say, <laughs> I know him, I, it's I mean. I completely <laughs> understand you, your, your question, but uh, you know, sometimes the patient believe in the doctor more than the numbers. Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. I take that for <laughs> very good. Patrick is my uh, great mentor. I always uh, respect, have a deep, deep respect to him. I learned a lot uh, from him when I, I was uh, I learned uh, I was in uh, Rotterdam, and he was really, really a 
very, very good teacher. I learned a lot from him. I owe him so much. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yeah. yeah. OK. I, I think this is a, a very important statement Patrick Serois just uh, made. And also the answer of the operator was great. And I think we do, do have to give the patient a chance to see both doctors. Because it's not about numbers, I think. Because uh, most of the patients cannot figure out what you mean with those numbers. Mm. But if they see you and if they see the surgeon independently, uh, I think this is then the, the, a trust can be built. It still will not be perfect, but this, the, I think this is the true patient doctor relationship that has to be, be built to believe, I mean, to, to, to trust the surgeon and to have this done is just as important as to trust you as the interventionist. More. I, I fully agree, and I, I must say that for almost. Uh, 15 years, I used to see the patient with Ari Peter Capitain, which was my surgeon, not only in syntax, but also in Excel. And it was a quite unique experience. I mean, uh, that's a little bit the spirit of the Torak Center, that both we were in the same room with the patient. He was making his story. I was making my story. And every time it, it was so intense because the patient said, oh, I have to listen to the surgeon, oh, I have to listen to the... But that's a little bit the real life if you want to have the, the correct balance between these two yeah. therapy. And, and you know, the surgeon with the uh, structural heart are somewhat in trouble now because it's getting better and better. The other day, Marty Leon said the, the, the tricuspid will be the field of the uh, interventional cardiologist because the surgeon doesn't dare to touch them, but in the coronary, they are still very yes. strong, believe me, yeah. believe me. Some I, I see, for instance, in the fast track, which is the trial where we don't give the cine angiography to the surgeon, only the multi-slice CT scan. When I calculate the syntax score in these patients, my God, you know, two total occlusion, a diagnose which is giving everything to the vessel, that's, I think, somewhat beyond our competence. That, that's my feeling. Yeah, and another thing uh, to, to move forward with your idea, of course, I agree. Uh, for this kind of patients with uh, comorbidities, uh, sometimes uh, we ask also, like for the, the um, TAVI, uh, the TAVI uh, uh, heart team, sorry, uh, we ask the anesthesiologist, because the surgeon will say, you, yeah, we can do cabbage. Of course, but the anesthesiology sometimes said, uh, no, cabbage is not a solution, it's PCI the solution because after the cabbage, the patient uh, will not do, be good. So sometimes anesthesiologists are also very helpful in this kind of decision, uh, like for the heart team, for the valves, and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, also the solution. Surgeons mm -hmm. are very enthusiastic for uh, cabbage because. Olivier, Olivier, I yeah? think, I think uh, I've been privileged to travel quite sometimes to Asia. I think there is a major cultural problem it's also why CTO oh, yeah, technology yeah. has been developed in Asia. There is a cultural problem for Asian people to open the chest. And you may discuss like this for 10 minutes and a long time, but I understand Tego cl very clearly. In Asia, patients very rarely go to surgery. It's, and, and that's the way it is. And we have to accept these cultural differences. We are not there to preach them what they should do. If they don't go for surgery, it's their decision, it's their culture, and we have to respect it. Of course. Yeah. The patient is a high-ranking official, state official, and he believes that he undergo a surgery, then it will ruin his uh, future career. Yeah. Just yeah. a moment. So, yeah, that <laughs> grow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What one question from uh, uh, Jose Ruiz? Uh, Thank just you, a Mary. minor uh, remark about the procedure um, uh, that highlights a dilemma that I am usually facing treating these complex cases. So on one hand, we know that final pot has interesting geometrical advantages. So everything uh, is uh, geometrically better after final pot. But on the other hand, if we are using drag-coated balloons, we tend to do the drag-coated balloon as the last application and not 
touching anymore mm. because maybe we are removing the drug or something like that. And uh, this was uh, one of the dilemmas that your case is also highlighting. So you decided to do POT after the drug coated balloon application. So I would like to uh, open the discussion <laughs> whether. Yeah. Just uh, yeah, very yeah. small. A uh, fantastic job, uh, Santoso. This is Shiban speaking. Um, I would like to ask you if this patient, if you will have a patient like this today, that will be the same approach or, uh, I mean, we have seen that patients finished with main vessels are uh, stented, uh, ray stenosis in uh, intermediate uh, branches are managed by medical therapy. So what will be your approach today in a patient like this? Thanks, Imad, yeah. my good friend, long time no see. Uh, in, this, in this patient, at, at the very beginning, when uh, during the index procedure, like uh, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, all the four vessels are important. These four vessels are relatively big vessels. So we need to save all these four vessels. But later on, when he developed resinosis at the side press, the dominant facets are only two. Uh, these are the these were the LED and the cirque. So we need to save just the LED and the cirque, and just uh, uh, apply the so-called keep it open strategy for the uh, the other two intermediate branches. But at the very beginning. Uh, all the four vessels are imp were important, so we need to save all these four vessels, and we have no other choice rather than uh, applying the uh, quadruple stamping strategy. Thank you. Uh, now we are going to vote. So the winner is uh, now everybody. Yeah, okay. So the winner is uh, is Dr. Guon, with. Uh, 36 person and just behind Dr. Santoso with 33 person. Yeah, one vote. One vote of difference. I think you are ex -echo. <laughs> Near ex <-echo. laughs> Thank you very much for this session. Thank you for your cases and uh, send uh, more cases, more and more. We check, I think, with Remo and, uh, and Francesco. F uh, 53 or uh, 55, or I don't know, I don't remember, 55 cases we received, very interesting cases, and we made the selection for the award for five cases, so thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Dr. Guo. Dr. Guo. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, I love the Dr. Santos's case, actually, yeah. so I have similar experience. I, I will vote for you. <laughs> yeah. See you tomorrow. Well. See you tomorrow morning. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. We are very proud of you.